My name is uh, Zara Kalantari, and we are here today at uh, part of History of Science uh, session at EGU. It is a great pleasure to interview Professor Dia Destoni from the Department of Physical Geography at Stockholm University. A little of uh, background. So I had the pleasure and fortune uh, starting working with Gia since 2014 in different research papers and projects, and uh, in many respects uh, being mentored by Gia. So Gia, uh, it is great to have you here this morning, and we look forward to uh, exploring about what you have done during your career life. So welcome. Well, thank you so much. It's great for me, too, to be given this opportunity to talk about my science and myself. And thank you for taking this task. <laughs> great. Thank you. So um, I would like um, to start with your childhood, um, where you were born and raised. Well, I was born in Greece in the 1960s and uh, uh, I went to school there for a few years and when I was nine year, years old uh, I moved with my family to Sweden so that was a big change uh, so most of my schooling and uh, university studies um, to this point uh, have been in Sweden but I still uh, speak Greek and I speak Greek with my children, so I have both cultures in me and the mixture of both temperaments. <laughs> it's mm. really nice. So when you reflect upon your career success, what have, you, what have been some of your fondest uh, career highlights along the journey? And has it been an easy journey or not? Well, uh, the start of the journey came, uh, uh, of course, I had, uh, since a child, I have a passion for uh, science, in particular physics and, and mathematics, but also for real-life problems and uh, being part of finding solutions to problems. So that's what led me into an en engineering studies to start with. And then I've always also always have a fascination with water as a, as a, a compound a very, with very weird properties and also how to be in water and how water feels and how it manifests itself. So all this went together uh, that in that in my studies I was most excited by. Uh, uh, fluid dynamics and uh, especially environmental problem dynamics related to that and also the, uh, uh, the water aspects of all these. And uh, so the most uh, defining moments were, were uh, first when I st started my PhD. Uh, I had not thought about doing, uh, doing a PhD, doing research. No one in my family had done that before. So I was uh, asked and recruited to this uh, as a student, last year's student. And then I saw a world opening up for me that I was very, yeah, that seemed very exciting and I haven't regretted it since. So that was a, an important moment to decide to do the PhD. And then when that finished, that was a very happy and exciting moment. And then as it happened for me, I also got, at the same time, I applied and got, uh, in fact, a senior research fellow position with the Swedish Research Council that gave me, directly after I finished my PhD, gave me both freedom and resources to pursue my own ideas. And uh, that was, uh, when I got that position, that was a very important moment. And then uh, when I made a move uh, from the engineering side of hydrology and hydraulics to the natural science and geoscience side of hydrology, moving from the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm to Stockholm University, that was also a um, an opening uh, moment uh, of, uh, of my uh, career. So, so these are quite defining moments. Was the path easy? No, <laughs> but why should it? <laughs> mm. 
Yeah, no, it wasn't. It was uh, <laughs> many struggles mm. and uh, ups and downs on the way, and that's the way it mm. is. I see. Mm. So what do you see as your major contribution to water science? Well, uh, the way I see it, uh, I have uh, looked to, uh, I have applied uh, my knowledge and my skills, but even most importantly, my curiosity to following the water, following the pathways of water and water on land in particular, through its many f manifestations and formations on, in, in the landscape and beneath the, uh, the land surface. And uh, as such, I think I have made contributions in linking these pathways in a coherent way. So I started working with the unsaturated zones, so, uh, flow and transport through that. Of course, you can't do that without also considering soil moisture and its variations. And then went on to link that with the groundwater dynamics, flow and transport then further link both the whole subsurface system to, to surface uh, waters, flow and transport, and looking at catchments as, as holes, uh, whole systems uh, in following the, the pathways of flow and transport. Uh, so I think I have made some um, contributions in those directions that I think are relevant to starting to understand the seeing the whole terrestrial water system as a whole. So um, talking about exactly what you have done since the beginning, you have been very much involved in the understanding and modeling of the groundwater the exchange of fresh water and salt water in coastal areas and the spread of contaminants uh, in water. So what do you consider as the most important open questions in your field or in this field? Uh, I would, uh, in this particular field of, of transport and contaminant, but also in hydrology as a whole, I think we need to, we have made lots of developments uh, so far, uh, looking at um, different components, separately at the different components of the water system, and understanding that in more profoundly and, and uh, with me mechanistically and uh, how things uh, develop and what the processes are. But I think uh, that uh, we also now need to go much further in looking at the system as a whole and trying to find the reveal patterns and changes in the system. And this is an important step to take because if we compare hydrology and the freshwater system with, for instance, our, our sister uh, disciplines, uh, oceanography and marine science, uh, atmospheric sciences, geolo geology and soil science. Uh, all these systems are very clear and can be seen and perceived directly as a whole. You see the sea, you see the ocean, so you know what system you are you are actually doing research about. Then you can always choose bits and pieces to focus on, but you still always have a, a perception of the whole system. The same goes with uh, for the atmosphere and the, the lithosphere for geologists and soils, land for uh, soil scientists. But for hydrologists, you don't see the system as a whole. Yeah. You just see bits and pieces of outcropping water, surface water here and there. Most of it you don't see. And I think because of that, it's difficult for us uh, to both among us uh, communicate about what water, what system are we working on? And why do we choose the bits and pieces that we choose to work on? Uh, in relation to the whole, because we don't see the whole. Also in, in our interactions with other scientists um, in earth system science, uh, it's difficult for them to understand what system uh, we are talking about, because they only see the bits and pieces. So we need to have this whole picture in order to be able to communicate and make 
even greater advances in our science, but also in interaction with all the other sister sciences that uh, form the Earth. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, let me ask you this question. So, if you had your time again, uh, would you do anything differently? So, are there research problems that you had um, thought of, but um, never had time to investigate? Well, I never had any strategic work plan or career plan for myself. So I had just let my um, curiosity and interests and, uh, and opportunities, of course, in, com in combination with opportunities, uh, guide my way through uh, wherever I am now. To, <laughs> Um, so would, uh, under different circumstances and understanding things the way I, I do now, uh, I, there are probably things I, the pathway would not look the same, for sure. But the overall, uh, I think, direction would be uh, similar, and uh, because it is guided by my interests and how I understand this field of, of research. But one thing, uh, of course, since I, I, I have focused quite a lot on, on um, contributing to linkages between the different water subsystems on land, and, and that is very difficult to convey in individual scientific papers, I think maybe what I would have liked to have taken more time uh, for is to actually put the things together in a book, in a longer uh, text. So I would have liked, uh, I haven't taken the opportunity so far to do that, but that is something I would like to do because that, that allows for a, a much better picture of how things link together. Great. So what work are you proud of? Well, uh, I think um, uh, the work that I have done with colleagues, uh, in, which we have done for a long time, uh, well, it's over a decade now and even more, on Central Asia, and in particular the, the Aral Sea drainage basin. This is a huge drainage basin of 1.7 million square kilometer um, and so covering quite a substantial bit of, of land on Earth. And uh, we have had one of the world's, uh, if not the world's greatest actual environmental disaster happening there in the total, near total desiccation of the Aral Sea. So with colleagues, we have um, had the opportunity through a series of projects in looking at uh, long-term time series and uh, of many different aspects of the water system there. Uh, the surface waters, the, the lake or inland sea itself, the Aral Sea, the groundwater, water fluxes, quantity and water quality from very different perspectives. And in, in that sense have been able to get to get a whole view of the changes that have occurred there, why they have occurred, and link the water system in that huge bit of land associated with this water. So I think that I'm, I'm quite proud of that work. And then that, the methodologies we have developed there to understand the system and link the water system as a whole, we have then been able to use in other, move to other parts of the world and use similar methods and, and then start to have a, a multiple comparative view of, of these types of uh, changes through in different parts of the world. Yeah. So how has hydrology changed over the last 30 years? Did you see that coming, like uh, changing, or uh, what did you predict? Uh, what took you by surprise? <laughs> well, uh, I didn't predict that much <laughs> for hydrology as a whole, but what I have seen happening is uh, th there are a few things. Um, overall, I think there, as, as more and more 
um, diverse types of problems related to water come apparent through all over the world, hydrology as a science or water science as a whole has uh, branched out into different uh, um, directions. Uh, I could just name a few. The, the, the initi community initiative to look at changes uh, of water in this Pantare initiative. We have eco-hydrology in trying to understand the interactions with other organisms on, on Earth. And we have social hydrology linking uh, the physical water system with the human actions and, and looking at both together as a few examples. Uh, so we have these different branches. And what we also see methodologically, uh, I think, is uh, uh, a shift um, from what used to be more uh, model developments and modeling exercises and studies of the water system because there was a general lack of data and so difficult to get data, uh, to now being more data-driven. So now we actually use more and more observations and more and more observations and data are actually openly available. And that has opened up huge opportunities for uh, understanding the system and uh, advancing the, the science. We also see a, a shift from local um, site-specific conditions that have been studied uh, quite a lot to moving to larger scales up to the, to the global scale. And I think all of these changes uh, are, uh, would be predictable. And then they can be surprising um, results in all of these. Uh, and, and, but that, that's science. That's what we're supposed to, to find, to discover surprising aspects that we didn't see before. And I think with these developments, we are, as a science, set up to discover more and more surprising and new things. So um, where do you see the future of hydrology? Well, I, I see it, maybe I'm biased, but I see it in the direction that I am also pursuing myself, going more from the bits and pieces and different components to the system as a whole, and uh, going more from esoteric uh, studies with the just uh, water in focus to interacting with other disciplines uh, in earth system science, but also in social science to to understand more complex problems and try to contribute to solving more complex problems and also um, understanding, going, um, understanding more complex systems, complex, complex interactions. Yeah. So um, now going to a little bit bigger perspective, talking about the world water crisis. What are your, view, your views on the current world water crisis? Uh, do you think that the academic uh, community foresee this? Um, and when you were young also, did you see that um, what's going to happen? Uh, and what are the role of the scientists and academic playing to solve these problems? Well, I, I don't see one uh, water crisis. Uh, first of all, crisis does not, well, it's a Greek word, mm -hmm. and it means uh, judgment, basically, that you come to a point where you may have to make some judgment calls uh, to determine how you, you want to go uh, in the future towards solving some problem or meet some challenge or scientifically. So crisis means that we have various uh, come to um, points where we need to uh, understand the system and make some judgments. And then there are different types of, of crisis. Uh, people often use the term crisis to talk about something sudden and, and something that has emerged that needs to be solved immediately. And that's one type of crisis, so water shortages that we see in different parts of the world. For instance, uh, talking about um, uh, this term 
day zero coming, like mm-hmm. Cape Town was coming to a day zero, when uh, meaning that their own freshwater supplies would, would be depleted. And there are different parts of the world that are there at the, are closing up on this uh, now. On the other hand, this, ca- this is not anything new. The world has known severe droughts uh, with associated uh, agricultural failures and uh, famines uh, uh, many times before. So whether you perceive this as something new or not, I think depends quite a lot on which part of the world have you been working in. So these types of crises are, are reoccurring uh, all the time. And then you have a crisis related to disasters um, of floods and uh, uh, mudslides and, and aspects like that that have also been re- recurrent uh, through uh, uh, history. Of course, the, the implications and impacts of these uh, fast events that where you need to react uh, are um, depend not only on the natural uh, events themselves, but uh, where are people living and uh, what how have soci- has society developed on the way? So what damages are there by the same types of events occurring now than when occurring previously? And of course, the world population has changed and uh, we are building all over the place, so we are more vulnerable, um, susceptible to to these uh, risks now. Could we foresee that? Yes, of course, Uh, but not in a deterministic way that that date of that year, this will happen, but in a statistical way, absolutely. And I think water scientists uh, should have uh, anticipated this. Then what you can do about it is not just a scientific question, it's a societal question. So this is a question of working uh, together, uh, academic sector and other sectors in society to, to handle these problems. And I think uh, overall the direction is towards this uh, type of collaboration. But there are other types of crises which are not immediately evident, creeping type of changes and uh, very often related to water quality. Of course, you have fast impacts also there, like microbiological and pathogen contaminations that happen and are immediately dangerous and that you need to do something about. Um, And also these have occurred uh, throughout history. But of course, when we use more water, because we're more people, we are again more susceptible and vulnerable to these types of changes. But then we have the long-term pollution no accident, no outbreak, but just a normal day-to-day activities, everything that we do that continuously add more and more um, different types of substances and pollutants to the world's water. And uh, this is more difficult to handle. And this is, I think, where science may have the greatest role to play because This is not something you can perceive immediately or you don't get sick immediately, but these are long-term changes and only science with a long-term view and a long-term follow-up of the system and its changes can help society perceive these type of creeping changes. And I think we have a a big role to play there. Interesting. So, thank you. so let me ask you about you, yourself. Mm-hmm. So during your entire career, which is still active, uh, you have always been incredibly productive. Um, so what has been and what is still your main um, driving force? Well, it is still and will always be curiosity and a passion for science, as well as a passion for water as, as a as a critical compound uh, for all life as we know it and for all aspects of society, uh, combined with my also engineering uh, uh, 
I would say, passion to actually not just ask scientific questions, but also think how they relate to society and if they can help society in some way. So I love this combination. <laughs> and, uh, and that's what drives me. Curiosity, fun, and uh, yeah. And uh, then in this, of course, when you are in the academic sector, you also have continuous interactions with young uh, researchers, students, uh, PhD students and postdocs and their energy and their commu communication with them in general is also a very strong driving force. You get to feel young. <laughs> <laughs> uh, over your career, so you have traveled widely and interacted with scientists from many countries. So what did you learn from travels and interactions with these people? Well, I, I have learned uh, many different perspectives and I've seen many different types of problems and how that depend on, uh, on the situation you are in and which part of the world you are in. And I have seen different ways of approaching uh, problems and solutions and, and even science in different parts of the world. And I think that's hugely enriching uh, personally, but also scientifically because you get a much wider uh, range of tools and palette of perspectives to, to choose from and combine to address your science and the problems you want to solve. Yeah. You have also received so many recognition and awards. For example, Henry Darcy, medalist of um, European Geoscience Union, EGU. So how do you feel about this recognition by your um, peers? Are there any that you want to highlight as particularly which is pleasing you? And oh, I, I was so honored and uh, happy and uh, yeah, humbled and uh, everything. Uh, receiving this medal from EGU, it was yeah, it was very very rewarding and uh, <laughs> for me and appreciated the same thing also being elected fellow of, of AGU and and uh, also when I was elected um, member actually I was an elected member of both these academies the Academy of Science and the Academy of Engineering Sciences the same year in 2003 and um, which was just 12 years after receiving my PhD and also the same year when I moved from uh, the Royal Institute of Technology to Stockholm University and in that way also broadened uh, my, from just an engineering perspective on hydrology to also have the natural science and geoscience perspective on hydrology. So this was uh, very important recognitions at that time and uh, strengthening and, uh, yeah, very appreciated. Um, it also gives you, I think, uh, uh, being in, in these academies, uh, it, it again helps to broaden perspectives of science and ways that you can work scientifically, but also towards with society on, on different types of uh, challenges and, and problems. So, yeah, they were very pleasing and, and uh, rewarding for me, yeah, all nice, of them. Nice to hear about it. So what is your life philosophy? Well, um, I've mentioned it several times. Uh, if we just talk about my science, my philosophy has been follow the water, follow the pathways of water to understand many things that are changing in society and in the environment. Uh, when it comes to me personally in science, I've mentioned fascination, your curiosity, and keep it fun all the time. That, Will that be um, rewarding career-wise? I cannot tell, but it's certainly rewarding science-wise and personally. So I would always give that advice. And that's my philosophy. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. So who is your um, greatest inspiration in life? And uh, who, 
who do you most uh, admire? So let me ask you, like, if you could host a dinner party with six people, still living or deceased, famous or unknown, from any walks of life, so who would you most like to have at your dinner table and what? Yeah, uh, I, there are many people who I, I look up to and who have helped me and I admire. And so in choosing a, a select few, six, I think you said, I'm not going to choose from uh, people that I currently interact with. And, and um, so I would choose and who I helped me a lot and I admire a lot, but I will choose people that um, I had no possibility to interact with or did not take the possibility to interact enough. So um, starting first, I, I would like to start first personally, I would invite my father. He's no longer um, alive, but he shared, uh, he, he was not a scientist. He was in fact an, a military attorney. Uh, but uh, the, I think the way he came into that is because that was the way he could afford to study, to have an academic career, to, to study law uh, paid by the military. So then he became a military attorney. But he was always fascinated with science. That was his passion, even though he himself could never pursue it. Uh, so I would invite him uh, also because uh, my father and I are very alike in this passion, but also in many other aspects, which often leads to conflict, mm -hmm. meaning that I did not take the opportunity that I could have taken, should have taken while he was alive to interact with him uh, scientifically, which he liked a lot. Anyhow, he would be delighted to be part of such a dinner party, so I would invite him. <laughs> Then uh, scientifically, going back, furthest back in time, I would invite Marie Curie, uh, not because uh, we share the same science, but because uh, she's an enormous role model and a an, uh, fantastic uh, uh, person and, and uh, as a woman to be able to uh, pursue science in the way she, she did and uh, do all these discoveries, getting two Nobel Prizes in two fields, you know, just talking with her and hearing about uh, her experiences and her drivers and her, the way she dealt with things would have been a great inspiration. So I would really want to have her there. Going a, a little bit closer in time, I would also invite uh, the physicist Richard Feynman because, uh, well, I told you that I'm in general very interested in physics. I have read, uh, been inspired by his the Feynman lectures of, of physics, uh, read everything, and also read his autobiographic books. Um, with the titles that I love, Surely You Are Joking, Mr. Feynman, and um, as, uh, oh, sorry, I forgot the other one, which was important to that <laughs> title, but it may come to me. But anyhow, I, uh, I also, I mean, he's also in a diff very different field of quantum mechanics, but scientifically, I, I love the way his contributions with uh, path uh, formulations and picture um, representations of the, of the behavior of subatomic particles. So he looked at them as pathways, and pathways is always what I have liked to pursue in, in, in my science, uh, and the dynamics of, of systems moving through pathways. So it, it was a, a basic inspiration and also, as I said, his books, but also the way he looked at science, his humor and his, um, um, yeah, his life story even uh, was an inspiration for me. Then coming uh, closer to my own area, uh, I would, um, 
invite Eschel Bressler from uh, who, who died in 1991. And he was an inspiration for me in getting into, together with Gideon Dagan, his colleague and, and friend, but he's still alive, so I'm not. <laughs> and, but Eschel Bressler was supposed to be the faculty opponent uh, for my, um, in my PhD defense, and he died just weeks before. Uh, so, uh, and he, his pay, early papers from, um, well, uh, early in stochastic subsurface hydrology, his papers together with Gideon Bagan on um, stochastic um, uh, processes in the unsaturated zone were very inspiring for me and what drove me to the subject I chose for my PhD studies. So I would like to have him uh, there since he couldn't come as faculty yeah. opponent yeah. when he, he would have. Uh, then in my understanding of fluid mechanics, I have had the great usefulness and pleasure of uh, reading the book of uh, James uh, Daly and uh, Donald Harleman on fluid dynamics. And especially Harleman, uh, he was a pioneer in the study of water pollution through water bodies and, and finding solutions to these types of problems. His focus was on, on surface uh, waters. That was very inspiring. And in a way, uh, I have uh, followed in part this type of problems uh, and, and scientific studies for the subsurface water. So I would invite him. And coming uh, further to present time, uh, to a person who is actually alive <laughs> and still going strong at 92 years old, uh, I would invite uh, Malin Falkenmark, the Swedish hydrologist, who is also an inspiration both as a woman in science, a woman in hydrological science, and a very strong uh, role model and uh, with very important contributions to, to in particular to global water issues. So I think what is in common for all of these is their passion for science, but also for using that science in relation to real world problems and uh, trying to contribute to, towards their solution. Oh, that would be a great dinner party. Exactly, wow. <laughs> um, so, how do you most want to be remembered uh, when people in the future reflect um, upon you, your work, and your life? Well, I, I would like uh, to be, to have made, uh, when all is said and done, uh, to have made some important contributions to, to linking the terrestrial water and uh, to get us to perceive this system as a whole system and, and, and look at its changes and, uh, and its behavior as a whole in relation to other geospheres like the atmosphere, the, the oceans and uh, lithosphere and not least the anthroposphere, the humans in, in the middle of all this water. <laughs> um, yeah, I have been working with you for a few years now, several years, so you are hugely energetic. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you get your um, tremendous energy from and uh, what motivates you to keep doing research after of all these years? Well, I have to mention fun again. You know, I played uh, basketball when I was um, young. And uh, also in that and in everything I do, it, it has to be fun. I mean, you, there are some players uh, who can do anything as long if it's fun, but that, <laughs> well, are not so good uh, when they feel it's boring. And I'm one of those. I was that in sports and I'm that in science. I, it has to be fun. I cannot think about career and uh, it just has to be fun, otherwise I will do something else. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And I also going through different perspectives mm. and interacting with other disciplines is part of making that fun, not doing the same thing all the time, but still having a, a connecting picture mm. and some type of connecting goal. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so is there any advice you would like uh, to pass on to the future generation of scientists and students? who may be viewing this interview. Yeah. Again, I repeat the curiosity and, and, and the fun as main drivers for scientific endeavor, whichever line. Uh, without that, there are so many ups and downs in, in the science and in scientific work throwing your uh, baby pa papers out to the harsh world of the reviewers and getting them back trashed and, uh, you know, and following dead ends. And so these are lots of downs. And the only thing that can get through, through you through that, I think with the maintained energy is curiosity. Um, and uh, the other thing is trying in general to, in science, to, to see the forest and not just the trees, the patterns of forest and not just details in whatever you're pursuing. To look up sometimes and see what does it mean in an overall picture. So, thank you so much, Gia, for letting us explore about your um, life, career, and... Uh, and sharing your experiences with us, it was, uh, it is much appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.